Good morning. Good morning. OCM Niskalti Shiam Sinasnat Marco Hatch. Uh, good morning, friends and relatives. My name is Marco Hatch. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm a faculty at Western Washington University and a member of the Samish Indian Nation. And I want to begin with this uh, picture to show you a little bit about uh, where I'm from as we sit in this windowless room. A um, little image of the Salish Sea, and we'll hear more about that um, uh, from uh, some later talks. Um, this is taken on the west side of San Juan Island uh, on a day we were doing some uh, science and uh, uh, culture camps with some Lummi youth. My talk today is about the integration of traditional ecological knowledge with big data and recruitment and retention of indigenous, indigenous students. And I'll be talking about three NSF programs that have supported this work, uh, both an NSF Includes project, a uh, NSF Geo Gold, which is kind of similar to an Includes, but it was funded by the Geoscience Division, um, and also a project called PAGE, which is a partnership in geosciences between the NSF Geoscience Division and the TCUP program, Tribal College and Universities uh, uh, program. Um, and I'll acknowledge those funding sources as we move through, uh, but just be aware that there's many different sections of NSF that have supported this work over the years. Our NSF project was called, the, um, our pilot project was called the NSF Includes Project. And to try to describe our project in um, one slide, uh, you could think of, uh, in the Coastal, uh, Coastal Almanac Project, we were focused on three types of communities. Um, ethnographic communities, primarily indigenous communities, fishing communities, um, and geographic communities, small coastal communities. And the idea is that people have observed change over time, um, but we in the broader kind of mainstream science have often lacked those observations. There are changes happening that we're not seeing, but people that have lived in that area for multiple generations are observing those changes. Um, and they have a better pulse on the environment than we do in the geoscience field. Uh, one example I give of that um, is I, I study clams. My doctorate's in clams. I've studied clams for years and years and years. And if I wanted to go do a clam project, um, and I went out and I started measuring the density of clams on a beach, uh, next to um, a reserve or uh, next to a, an indigenous population. And I go out and measure density on clams. I walk out the beach, I throw my quad out around, I measure density. Then I take those data and I use it for management decisions. If I use it for, well, I went out and I didn't measure any clams, so we're going to close down harvest. That would cause uh, some ill will with that group, right? I went out and I measured a bunch of things and I didn't do it in the right spot. I didn't ask them where, they, where the clams are. I just went out and randomly, because I had to fit to my science, I randomly selected points on the beach. And I might have missed those like really dense patches of clams. That when you go out and you stand on a mud flat and you look out, it kind of all looks the same, right? You stand out, you're like, mm, it's a beach, right? It's like all the same. But if you know that beach really well, if you dug clams on that beach for your entire life, if your parents dug clams on that beach, if your grandparents, for time immemorial, if your people have been digging clams on that beach, you know that it all looks the same, but it's not, right? That there's nuance out there. There's little pockets that have high densities of clams. And if your experience with science is people going out and asking the wrong question in the wrong spot, you might not have a lot of faith in, in that system, right? Whereas what I would do and have done is if there's a project the community wants me to work on, the first thing I do is go in and have coffee and say, who's your best clam digger? I go to that person, um, have coffee, and hire him for a couple of days, then we go out and talk about clams on the beach. And, and in that one day, you'll get more information than you can from years and years and years of throwing quadrats in the wrong spot, right? And so that was kind of the basis of this Coastal Almanac, is that if your experience with science has been people asking the wrong question in the wrong spot and then shutting down your harvest, you might not have a very high opinion of it. So can we work with local communities um, with a community advisor, somebody that goes between, a liaison between our subject advisors, geoscientists, environmental scientists, um, and the community, this person that liaisons back and forth, um, brings up community-based questions, um, works with uh, kind of a select few scientists uh, that are well-behaved, um, and starts to look at some of these changes people have seen. Um, and then work with communities to record and understand those observations. And so most of our pilot projects were spent on, on how you would do that. 
what's the framework required for that sort of project? And going around to a bunch of different Coast Salish communities was really interesting because we started to see, just in the pilot phase, we started to see some patterns that, in particular, there was a few traditional plants, a uh, few medicines, that every community we talked to had said, oh, we've seen a decline in that plant. But they're not talking to one another, right? Um, they're not sharing that observation. And then through these conversations, we start to see there's a regional decrease in this plant that's really quite important. But in the like mainstream, it's not a plant that people are out looking at. It's not a rest, uh, western red cedar that people can see. It's this big iconic tree. But the indigenous, the Coast Salish people are seeing this decline. Um, and it's not being seen anywhere else. It's not being acknowledged or recorded anywhere else. And so the idea is to have a number of communities and then have a network of those communities to look at regional scale changes. So I'll share a little bit about the framework um, of this project and um, how, talking to a bunch of different folks, how we've decided or, or think that these projects could be structured. And to quote Thomas King, the truth about stories is that's all that we are. So I'd like to begin with a story that I think exemplifies some of our, our goals and some of our approaches. Long ago, if a family needed a new canoe, um, they would meet with their community carver and talk about, what's this canoe for? Is it an ocean-going canoe? Is it a river canoe? Is it for fishing? Is it for long trips or short trips? What is the purpose of this canoe? And they'd have a conversation back and forth, and then when they decided on what sort of canoe was needed, the carver would go out in the woods. He'd go out and look for the perfect red cedar, the perfect cedar tree for this canoe. And once that, that tree was found, it wasn't simply cut down. There was a conversation with the tree. Um, the carver would tell the tree what, uh, what a great family uh, this family was that needed a canoe, what the canoe would be used for, how it would be honored as a canoe. And these conversations may take days or weeks. And if the tree agreed, uh, it would be cut down and then have a new life as a canoe. But now we no longer have those large cedar trees. Um, and so now when we make a canoe, we often need to use two trees. And the process is still the same. We still go out and pray to the tree and respect the tree, but now it takes two trees to make one canoe. And these two trees have to meld together. They have to maintain their individual identities as separate trees, uh, but they, they have to form a relationship. They have to form a bond. If one tree thinks it's better than the other tree, uh, if one tree disparages the other tree, um, it'll cause cracks in the canoe. And those cracks will lead that canoe to fall apart and break, and the people inside uh, might drown. And so it's really important that these trees do two things, maintain their identity, but at least form some understanding, form some um, bond, uh, respect one another. And you can think of these two trees as traditional ecological knowledge in Western science, that they have separate identities, um, uh, and you can think of, of the canoe as our environment and us as the inhabitants of that environment. And so if you want to uh, promote and protect the, our environment to the, to the best possible uh, way, we need to incorporate all forms of knowing and we need to respect all forms of knowing. And so the question becomes, how can we bring these two trees together? It's obviously not a picture of trees, it's a picture of the Grand Canyon. But nonetheless, there's a large divide between these two areas. Um, and how can we bring them together? How can we bridge this d divide? Um, how can we have uh, respect for community knowledge and science at the same time? And Boundary Spanner is one way of doing that. Um, I want to acknowledge that the Boundary Spanner term has been used at the organizational level uh, by some good work by Safford et al. 2007. Um, and in this paper, they looked at boundary spanners, again, as organizations. You can think about land-grant institutions and their cooperative extension, extension programs. Sea Grant, that has a vision for thriving coastal ecosystems and communities that are supported by an engaged public and informed decision makers. That organizations can have this mission and vision to bridge communities and science. Um, but when we... Uh, 
uh, through this project when we started looking at all of the different projects that we really love, when we go out and look at uh, these, like this clam garden restoration project, we look at these projects where you're like, that's a good project, right? Like that project is what we want. That's like the apex of uh, science engagement, community engagement, youth engagement. You think, what did that? Did an organization do that? Or did an individual do that? And so we, we tend to think about, and I'll talk about boundary spanners on the individual level. Uh, and James, I, I really liked your boundary warriors. <laughs> I got a kick out of that, I appreciate that. Um, and so we, we've heard of boundary spanners all, uh, yesterday. And so we'll expand upon that a little bit today. But I do like the idea of a boundary war warrior. Um, and so in our, in our project, we've looked at boundary spanners both as an individual or a small team of individuals. And one of the communities we work in, the Swinomish community, the boundary spanners are a team. Larry Campbell, who's a Swinomish elder, um, and Jamie, Don Jamie Donawatu, who's um, non-native but been working for Swinomish for 20 plus years, has a PhD, and she talks to the science side. Larry talks to the community side, um, and together, they are able to translate science and community speak, community concerns and scientific questions back and forth. Um, boundary spanners can be a, a community member. One of the boundary spanners we work with um, is a Staminas woman uh, who's pursuing a PhD in marine ecology. Um, and they really act as this fulcrum of, of partnership that everything's moving back and forth through this individual. So it can be a very taxing position, but it's very important. Um, and we believe one of the foundations to these good partnership projects. As I'm a bit sciencey, I have to graph this. Start with our x-axis, the axis of science. The axis of science goes from discovery to solutions, from discovery of a new factoid that might not matter in people's daily lives to a real world solution. My drinking water is not safe to, to drink, right? So we can think of the axis of science along this spectrum. And then the axis of the individual, what's driving your daily motivations? What's your primary concern throughout the day? Um, I probably should have flipped this because it, it presents a hierarchy, which I apologize for. But curiosity or wonder is at one end of the spectrum, and worry or concerns at the other one. Curiosity about some little factoid of science, or worry or concern, again, about a very real concern in your daily life loss of a species that's impacting your inherent right to go out and harvest and collect. Um, contaminated drinking water, air pollution, things like that. Established geoscience tends to hang out um, in the upper left corner here, uh, going from questions about interesting factoids to creating these interesting factoids. Creations of new facts, right? Um, underrepresented, underserved, and disenfranchised communities tend to be in the other corner uh, where the concerns are very real. Salmon didn't return this year. We're losing our important medicines. Our water's not safe to drink. They tend to be in separate spaces. And so how can we start to bridge that gap? And that's often where a boundary spanner comes in is can, um, in the geoscience realm, to get funding, you often have to have some new kind of sexy hypothesis, right? Um, which isn't necessarily what the community is concerned about, but is there a way that we can bridge that? Is there a way we can bring resources in from established youth science that are addressing uh, real world concerns and also work with communities to open up new discovery spaces? There's lots we don't know. Um, and without using all forms of information, we're, doing, we're not doing the best science possible. So the boundary span is really important in, in kind of bridging that gap. Um, and I think many people in this room are boundary spanners, and I hope that the idea of boundary spanner resonates. Um, I'm going to ask you to take a few minutes and just think about the people you know that exemplify this idea of a boundary spanner, and then what qualities do you think they exhibit? When you think of your list of boundary spanners, what are one or two words you would use to describe them? Um, I ask you to take a, a couple, a minute or two to think about that and then talk about it with your neighbor and then we'll share out a little bit. So who, when you close your eyes and think, who's a, who's a boundary spanner? And if you had to describe them in two words, what two words would you use?
Okay. <laughs> I'll just bring you all back now. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. So, I won't ask you to name names. Um, but does somebody want to uh, uh, call out a quality, and I'll repeat it for the, for the webcast here, that they uh, think identifies? Yes, sir. Translator, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Attention to detail. Larry, is that you? Interpreter, yep. Listener. Passionate. Compassionate. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Compassionate. Uh, tenacious or stubborn about getting what their community needs. So a real advocate. Yeah, with a strong code of ethics. Yeah. Yes. Non judgmental. Consistency. Open. Forward thinking. Wow. Good communicator. Okay, one more, yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. That's, that's a great one, and I actually don't have it on my list. It's thick-skinned. It's thick-skinned. You get corrected by an elder, you just got to take it, <laughs> right? And sometimes you, like, you come out, and you're like, man, I got to whoop it, you know? And then a little bit later, you reflect on it, and you're like, okay, it's, it was with good intention, but you get corrected, and you got to show back up at that table. If you don't show back up at that table, well, obviously, you're done. But it's, sometimes it's a test, right, um, to come back to that table, so... Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent one, thank you. Uh, to help get this idea, we uh, at the Coastal Almanac made a list of our six or eight uh, favorite boundary spanners, uh, people that were really respected in the Coast Coastal community, and we brought them together and, and asked a number of questions about their position as boundary spanners. How can we uplift and support them? Because frequently this boundary, span, boundary spanner function isn't fully acknowledged. Um, uh, one of our boundary spanners was told by their boss that, well, anybody can do this project. Like, you're replaceable. And you're like, yeah, exactly what? <laughs> like, no, this is a really specialized, very important person that when you pull them out of this project, your years of work is going to come crumbling down. Now, there's other people that could f come fill in that role, but not just anybody, that these are really important functions. And so through our, our conversations, um, we came up with a number of characteristics ability to listen, a reflector or a mirror. And so when you're in a community meeting, folks are talking, don't jump in and interject. Let the conversation meander and go, and eventually it'll wind up where it should. And then at the end, reflect back. Say, this is what I heard. Write it down. Uh, have them read it and uh, approve it. Make sure that you're reflecting back on what you heard so you don't misunderstand it. Many of our boundary spanners are reluctant gatekeepers meaning that they didn't feel it was their position to function as a gatekeeper, that it wasn't their uh, role within the, within the community to do that. But if they thought you were going to cause harm, they would, they would be a gatekeeper. Um, they understand the community protocol. Um, and another key function is they have cred or credibility in both the communities and in STEM. And so they could walk in with a bunch of scientists and say, flash their, their badge and um, have their credibility and then the same within community as well, that they have to have credibility in both those spaces. Uh, they often feel that their role as an educator, a translator, which we heard, translating science speak to community language and, and vice versa, uh, to facilitate, uh, to advocate for direct funding. And so one of the things that Boundary Spanners reported is they get a well-meaning scientist knocking on their door uh, hey, I want to do this project. Um, I want to extract knowledge from your elders, but I don't have any money. Kind of a non-starter uh, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, but really protecting the community from inequitable projects. And so really creating um, 
To me, in a grant proposal, the most important thing is your budget and your budget justification. So really starting uh, these partnerships well before anything's written, uh, before things are allocated. And then we asked these boundary spanners, one, we asked them about bad partnerships and we got a whole list of that. But I want to focus on uh, the question of the boundary spanners. If you could envision your ideal partnership, what would that look like? Um, and they talked about long-term commitment that uh, from their perspective, don't show up at their door with a grant due in two days and you want a letter of support. That come in, talk, get to know one another, um, start to build those relationships, and then down the road, if something makes sense, then we can work on that together well in advance of the deadline. But these relationships take a very long time. Um, and they wanted people that are willing to experiment and do things differently instead of uh, question status quo. And I know in the work that I do, there are basically every rule that our accounting office has, I have to break. You can't buy gifts on a grant. Turns out you can. You have to call it a physical honorarium. Oh, there's NSF people here. Uh, <laughs> physical honoraria are apparently allowed, gifts are not. Um, when I've got somebody coming in and I want to wrap them, I gotta figure out how to get a blanket. I have to figure out how to put uh, cash in people's hands. Like there are things that are difficult. Uh, provide honoraria on on site, not three months later. Um, hire community members to cook. It's there's all of these things that we have to break. Your first uh, response is always no, we can't do that, and you have to figure out well how. Like that's not that no is not the answer I want or that I'll accept. <laughs> um, and also you have to be willing to put your ego in the back seat that your questions might not be the most important questions. And so you have to be willing to do an experiment in a different space than you normally would, which is, in my vision, the point. Um, they often mention that having folks that do a lot of the institutional paperwork and reporting things is beneficial. And I underlined the last one, because I want to talk about that a bit more, is determine in the beginning what is needed for all participants to feel valued and honored. And I think that's where, coming from agency or academia, we often maybe don't understand what that would look like at the community level. And so one idea we've been working on is the virtuous exchange. And the idea of the virtuous exchange is that currencies are different in different spaces. In the academic world, we kind of hopefully have a, a clear understanding of our currencies, teaching, um, service and research in that. If I'm engaged in community projects, I can uh, talk about that in my service. I can have papers that generate from that for my research. I could bring folks I'm working with in. I could bring the experiences into my classroom to enrich my teaching experiences. So the, the currencies are pretty clear from the academic side. But the community currencies are often totally different. And um, we can't assume what they are. We have to know our community and, and ask what, you know, what is of value to you and what would be of value to you out of this project. So I'm gonna do a, another quick discussion with your neighbor. Based on the communities you work with, what would be considered a community currency? What are folks um, seeking out of this relationship, um, both tangible and intangible benefits?
Okay. We'll bring it back here. I know this one's uh, a bit stickier, which is why I asked it. Um, any, uh, did anybody come up with a, a currency that, uh, from the communities that they're uh, working with? Yeah. Validity and acknowledgement. Yeah, that's one I hear a lot too. Is um, you know, if you're here from some fancy university. How are you going to um, uh, help uh, in K-12 programs, provide internships for students, provide pathways for sure? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I have to repeat that for the microphone. So respect <laughs> um, and cherishing and honor the um, what what is shared. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Commun uh, integrity for the community, and then one from this side. Move on. Yeah. Um, so my my perspective is a little different because I'm in. Yeah, so, so um, he said uh, land access for public buy-in, which is for sure, for sure true. Uh, so this work was supported by a, a Geo Gold uh, project. Just want to quickly acknowledge that. And we're going to pivot a bit to um, working with students in our last few minutes together. Uh, so in my lab, the Coastal Communities and Ecology Lab, uh, we really focus on, on three things. Uh, student success, science that matters, and, and partnership and outreach, and, and those three um, components are really key um, to one another that a lot of the partnership and outreach we do um, is really facilitated by having uh, a bunch of um, students from diverse backgrounds um, having a fair number of indigenous students in our lab um, those students are engaged by the work that we do because it's work that matters it's work that's in concert with communities um, and so through the use of place-based research and, and particularly place-based research with some intention, um, I've been able to recruit and retain a fair number of undergrads and graduates through my lab. Um, and one thing we do is uh, celebrate. Um, so the picture in the uh, upper left, I actually didn't realize it's her birthday today, but um, a Sonny Tadlock. And then when students win awards, when they um, go to a conference and present a poster, or they get a scholarship, we often celebrate with pie. It's, it's a relatively simple thing, but food brings people together. And uplifting and acknowledging those times is really, really important. Um, do a fair amount in the work, uh, field, um, and we do a fair amount of outreach with, um, with various youth groups. And um, the upper right's from Northwest Indian College. We've uh, helped graduate a fair number of students. Um, I've had a fair number of students go on and uh, do well at conferences. Um, and when you look at the awards that they've won and the science that we do, really, we count things. There's nothing high tech in my lab. We count baby clams, <laughs> grains of sand, big clams, little clams, things like that. Uh, critters on the beach, we count things. It's not that hard. Um, <laughs> But when the students go out and present, they're so passionate about the projects. They're so passionate about the intent of the work and the way that it's done that it's infectious. And so when folks come around, they just fall in love with the students and their projects. And um, it's really that passion that's, that's driving that, that the science is not the most high intensity science. But it's important work, and they carry that with them, which I think is, is great. Um, and then. Uh, we have another project, which is a page project, which is a partnership between uh, geosciences and um, the Teacup program, tribal colleges and universities program. The intention of this project is to uh, help facilitate more Native students getting a graduate degree. So this is a four plus two model. Students that graduate from Northwest Indian College with a bachelor's of Native environmental science are eligible for a fully funded master's degree um, 
Fellowship at Western Washington University. So as part of this project, we're helping students get graduate school ready at Northwest Indian College. They've increased their course offerings to meet the prereqs of most graduate schools, um, increasing the quantitative content, doing GRE support, G paying for GRE tests, um, helping students apply for graduate programs. At Western uh, and Northwest Indian College, we're trying to create more shared opportunities um, to get students together with faculty to get to, to know one another. Um, and we're trying to create a more inclusive and supportive environment at uh, Western Washington University. And so uh, it's really getting kind of over that hump of having, uh, right now we've got two students from Northwest Indian College in the master's program, but starting to create a community. Um, we're a predominantly white institution and a, one of the least diverse um, disciplines at that institution. Um, and so having more students of color um, in my lab, having more um, indigenous students at the undergrad and graduate level has been really key to the this success of this project, as well as having the master students go back and mentor Northwest Indian College undergrads for their summer research. Uh, this is in the year uh, four of a five-year project, um, and we've learned a fair amount. I'm going to end with a quick story. Um, this this story uh, was shared with me, and I share it with you with permission from Sky Augustine, a stimulus woman I've worked with closely for a number of years. And like many great stories, it starts in the kitchen. But there are two groups of people that traditionally didn't get along. They've had differences over the years, and they decide, let's get together in the kitchen and uh, make something. Food unites us, food brings us together, let's make something we can share a meal. Should we grill something, cook it on the oven or in the stove? They decide, let's bake something. Let's bake something and let's go home to our home communities and bring some ingredients that really mean something to us and bring them back the next day and we'll bake something together. Great. So the first group goes back to their home community. They're all excited that we're going to do this great partnership project. Um, it's going to start us off in a good way, in a new way. And they talk to their community and they collect a whole bunch of ingredients that really mean something to them. And they come back the next day. And the next day, the second group of people walk in with all of these cookies. Just beautiful, symmetrical cookies. They all look delicious. They're just piles and piles of these amazing looking cookies. And they say, hey, we brought cookies. Can you decorate them for us? And the other group says, well, we wanted to make bread. With that, Hashka, thank you. <laughs> you have time for questions?